Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we're inviting all delegates to please take your seats. Reminding everyone to switch off mobile phones and cellular devices to the silent mode throughout the proceedings of this ceremony and to strictly also observe health procedures to prevent the spread of COVID-19 by wearing your mask, washing your hands regularly and keeping a safe distance. For the Q&A session, please feel free to raise your hand for comments or questions to the panelists. The committee will come to you to hand in the wireless microphone. English Indonesian interpreting system is available. Please acquire the headsets from the registration desk attendants at the entrance. For our virtual audience, kindly pay attention to the following house rules for the event. Kindly use the virtual background that you can find in the chat box. For easy identification, please key in the username format, your country, followed by your institution, followed by your name. For the Q&A session, you can send your question in the chat box with the following format. Your name, followed by your institution, followed by your, the question you're addressing to whom, and followed by your question. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention.
His Excellency, Minister of National Development Planning of the Republic of Indonesia. His Excellency, Chief of Planner, Ministry of National Development Planning of the Republic of Indonesia. Her Excellency, Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany to Indonesia, ASEAN and Timor-Leste. His Excellency, British Ambassador to Indonesia and Timor-Leste. Government officials, honorable guests, esteemed speakers, resource persons, moderator, distinguished delegates online and offline physically here with us, guests, ladies and gentlemen. Om Swastiastu. Good afternoon and welcome to the island of the gods Bali. To the G20 side event, third development working group meeting, towards implementation and beyond, measuring the progress of low carbon and green economy, launching ceremony of green economy index, and talk show, nexus between development, climate change, and biodiversity, proudly presented by the Ministry of National Development Planning of the Republic of Indonesia, with UK govern government, WRI Indonesia, German government, GIZ, GGGI, UN page, in collaboration with the G20 Development Working Group. Today, the 9th of August, 2022, we open the program proper with the national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the national anthem of the Republic of Indonesia. Indonesia Raya. Please be seated. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please now welcome the British Ambassador to Indonesia and Timor Leste to deliver his remarks. HMA Owen Jenkins on the screen. Assalamualaikum. Selamat siang dan salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Om Swastiastu Om, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Your Excellency, Mr. Suaso Onoafa, Minister for National Development and Planning of the Republic of Indonesia. Your Excellency, Ms. Ina Lepel, Ambassador of Germany to Indonesia. Honorable speakers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon to you all in Bali, Indonesia, and some of you in Asia, 
and good morning to those of you in Europe. It's truly an honour for me to join you in this G20 Development Working Group event. I'd like to congratulate the Government of Indonesia for so successfully running the G20 presidents this, presidency this year, while at the same time still facing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and of the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine. The COVID-19 crisis has produced a multifaceted dilemma, impacting not only on the economy, but also on all of our efforts to reduce poverty and achieve equality. While the world is still attempting to recover after COVID-19, tackling the climate crisis and accomplishing our net zero targets remains a key priority for all of our countries. As a result, appeals have been made for economic measures that simultaneously assist recovery and contribute to decarbonisation goals. In the UK, the low carbon economy is already worth more than £200 billion. That's nearly four times the size of our country's manufacturing sector. The transition to a green economy has the potential to boost economic growth and to create sustainable jobs, while at the same time helping address the climate catastrophe and maintaining nature's carrying capacity. Since 1990, emissions in the UK have been cut by over 40% and the UK has made tremendous progress in decarbonising energy generation and energy intensive industries. The UK Parliament enacted legislation in 2019 committing my country to eliminating net greenhouse gas emissions by 100% by 2050. If the UK achieves this objective, it will become a net zero emitter. However, as we move forward on the decarbonisation path, especially after the pandemic, it will become increasingly complex and expensive and reaching net zero will necessitate significant changes right across our economies. The transition process will require not only considerable investment in new technologies, but also major policy alignments in the area of the macroeconomy, employment, the environment and industry. A green economy would assist sustainable development by focusing on the economy, on investment, on capital, on infrastructure, jobs and skills with beneficial social and environmental consequences. Therefore, the existence of a specific development index with concrete, representative and tangible indicators of success is required. A solid green economy index can be used nationwide to measure progress made, as well as analyse opportunities and risks inherent in the green economic transformation for future development planning. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, since 2018, the United Kingdom has been actively supporting the Government of Indonesia through the Ministry of Development and Planning, BAPANAS, through the Low Carbon Development Initiative, the LCDI. For the last four years, significant achievements have been made, including integrating the LCDI into the Mid-Term National Development Planning Document, the development of the LCDI platform to project Indonesia's green policy scenarios towards net zero and supporting various policies related to the green economy. And as the focal point of the G20 Development Working Group, Bapanas has shown strong leadership in implementing low carbon development into the green economic recovery process, an outstanding example that aligns with the G20 2022 presidency themes of recover together recover stronger. In its efforts to advance its green economy leadership, BAPANAS, with the support of the UK Government, has formulated Indonesia's Green Economic Index based on the low carbon development scenarios. The Green Economy Index, which consists of 15 indicators classified into three pillars, environmental, social and economic, will provide a measuring and a reliable tool to track Indonesia's green economic progress. Therefore, it is essential to showcase this important achievement during the strategic G20 side event meeting. Referring to the assessment results, the Indonesia Green Economy Index in the period 2011 to 2020 has shown a rising trend, indicating the right track for the country's green economic growth. This achievement needs to be maintained with full and sustained government support. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this collaboration between the UK and Indonesia represents both another success of the Low Carbon Development Project and 
a joint step forward in the pursuit of a sustainable future. As some of the main actors on the issue of climate change, the UK and Indonesia are proud to lead our fellow world leaders in the transition to a greener and better economy. Finally, on behalf of the UK government, I would like to congratulate the government of Indonesia through the Ministry of National Development and Planning on the launch of Indonesia's first Green Economy Index. I look forward to continuing the UK-Indonesia partnership as part of the UK-Indonesia Partnership Roadmap Agenda 2022 to 2024 to accelerate the shift to a green economy for Indonesia to support action on climate change and low carbon and sustainable development. I wish you all a very fruitful discussion and please do enjoy your time in Bali, the island of gods. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency Ambassador, for emphasizing the policy alignments. Next, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome onto our screen Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany to Indonesia, ASEAN, and Timor Leste to deliver her remarks. Her Excellency Ina Lapel. Excellency Mr. Suharsu Monoarfan, Minister for National Development Planning, Deputy Minister for Maritime and Natural Resources Affairs of Bapenas, Mr. Jay Desai Premanam, dear honorable guests, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation to this important discussion on low carbon development and green economy ahead of the D20 Development Ministers meeting in September. I believe today's session will be instrumental for sharing ideas experiences and knowledge of the G20 for the urgently needed green economic transformation as we all recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Allow me to take a moment and share a couple of points. Over the last years and the last five months, the entire world community has experienced multiple global crises. It shows one, once more how vulnerable we are. The COVID pandemic took many lives as well as livelihoods and put the global economy under stress. In addition, we are still facing the catastrophic crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss we have created over the last decades. This year again, we are experiencing heat waves in Europe and North America with devastating forest fires, increasing sea levels and flood disasters in many parts of the world, putting our well-being at risk. And while the science is unequivocal, there is a clear correlation between climate change, biodiversity loss and the increase of zoonotic diseases, we are still not doing enough to address the risks of climate change and biodiversity loss as we are emerging from the pandemic. Although an unprecedented amount of almost 14 trillion US dollar has been spent by the G20 on the economic recovery, so far only around 6% of these expenditures is in line with what we call green recovery. A green recovery to significantly cut emissions, to transform our economies to low carbon industries, to decarbonize the energy and transport sectors, to remove unconditional subsidies for high emission industries. It is thus our responsibility as G20 to use these great amounts for corrective measures aligned with the 2030 agenda and the Paris Agreement targets as well as global biodiversity targets to build back better. Therefore, although I am unable to join this event in person, I would like to express my deep appreciation to Indonesia for putting the topic of sustainable recovery and low carbon economic development high on the agenda of this year's G20 Presidency and to all participants for joining today's meeting. I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate Bapenas on this occasion on the launching of its Green Economy Index, which can function as an important tool to measure progress in the achievement of a low carbon and climate resilient cross-sectoral development in Indonesia. During this year's G7 presidency, and especially in these exceptional times, Germany has put the Paris Agreement target as well as the SDGs 
at the heart of our G7 presidency agenda. As G7, we have committed ourselves to living up to our global responsibility, for example, by decarbonizing our power sector by 2035, by accelerating the coal phase out, and by working towards establishing a climate club. In addition, we want to work together to mobilize 600 billion US dollars over the next five years towards global partnerships for infrastructure and investment, and we want to work together towards just energy transition partnerships to accelerate renewable energies, also with Indonesia. And as G20 countries, I hope we can work together with lawmakers, business, science and academia and civil society to make sure that we keep the 1.5 degree target within reach. As for Germany, we stand ready through our bilateral cooperation, such as through the Climate and Biodiversity Hub Indonesia, in supporting the Indonesian government and other emerging countries in strengthening and mainstreaming low carbon climate, energy and biodiversity policy and in sharing our experience. I believe that we can make our societies more climate friendly and at the same time more resilient if we continue to work closely together as G20 and as a global community. Once again, thank you for your invitation and participation. Thank you, Your Excellency Lapel, highlighting commitment and the importance of measure. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is now our honor to have the Minister of National Development Planning of the Republic of Indonesia to deliver the inaugural speech, which will be continued by the officiation of the launch of Green Economy Index. Please welcome onto our screen His Excellency Suharso Monoarfa. His Excellency, Mr. Owen Jenkins, British Ambassador to Indonesia and Timor-Leste, Her Excellency, Ms. Ina Lepo, German Ambassador to Indonesia, Asian and Timor-Leste. Honorable Speaker, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all of you. Two years and a half since the onset of the pandemic, the world has slowly learned to live side by side with the COVID-19 virus while the global economy has entered the stage of recovery. In 2021, the global economic growth experienced a strong rebound to 5.5%, signaling a recovery progress. The same case happened in Indonesia. Our economy grew by 5.01% in the first quarter of 2022. However, our assessment at BAPNAS indicates that despite the positive recovery progress, Indonesia's economic trajectory growth will remain difficult to return to its pre-pandemic situation if we follow a business-as-usual approach. For this reason, Bapenas established economic transformation with six strategies that are expected as game changers to lift up our economic trajectory back to the pre-pandemic path. This transformation will enable Indonesia to realize Indonesia's vision 2045 of becoming a high-income country. Green economy strategy has become one of the game changers within Indonesia economic transformation framework. The main principle of our green economy is clear, to create high economic growth while fostering social welfare and maintaining environmental quality and carrying capacity by focusing more on attracting green investment, managing sustainable asset and infrastructure, as well as ensuring just transition and empowering human resources. Indonesia has a set of integrated platforms as the backbone in applying 
the green economy, which have been integrated into our national development planning document, so-called low carbon development and climate resilience. Implementing these policies will not only allow Indonesia to reap benefits of the economic, social, environmental nexus, but also will create significant opportunities to achieve sustainable development goals as well as the net zero emission by 2060 or sooner. While we are striving to implement a green economy with low carbon development and climate resilience as the backbone, we need to start to think beyond implementation. The key issues here are how to keep our green economy on track and how to measure the progress. Hence, we are proud to launch Indonesia first ever measuring tools to track Indonesia progress toward green economy, the Green Economy Index. The index comprises 15 indicators of economy, environment, and social pillars that are representative, tangible and accurate, and measured by the methodology that is commonly used in international practices. Beyond tracking the progress, the Green Economy Index also means to navigate Indonesia growth by referring to our national development target and global best practices, as well as utilizing uh, to analyze risk and identify policy options throughout the economic transformation. Based on our assessment, Indonesia green economic performance showcases an upward trend over the 10-year period, reaching a composite index score of 59.17 in 2020. This indicates that we are more than halfway there to completely reaching a green economy. By elaborating further on the index, we should understand which indicators require more attention and put some prioritization on them. This green economy index is another milestone for Indonesia is moving towards a green economy. Another piece that we put together in building up a green economy for our sustainable future. We believe that continuous improvement is a must in order to maintain and carry on our achievement. The launch of the, the Green Economic Index during the G20 event evidence that accelerating the implementation of green economy remains the top priority for Indonesia demonstrating the spirit of recover together, recover strong. We would like to use this opportunity to highly appreciate all the support from our development partners, especially from the government of the United Kingdom and the German government that have become our main partners since the very beginning. Therefore, we are welcoming other G20 members countries in partnering and forming a joint force in supporting our initiative. We trust that only by strengthening collaboration with our partners, we will be able to secure the bright future of the green economy around the globe. Finally, by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I officially launched the Indonesia Green Economy Index. Thank you.
National Development Planning, Honorable Director for Environment, Ministry of National Development Planning, Honorable Development Director UKFCDO, and Honorable GIZ Cluster Coordinator for BMUV. Please stand to receive the Green Economy Index Report. Let's give our applause of appreciation to the dancers. Thank you very much. Development in today's world, the global society is facing 10 most severe risks over the next decade. The World Economic Forum has identified five environmental risks as the most critical long-term threats to the world. These risks are perceived to be the most damaging to people and the planet. Climate action failure, extreme weather, and biodiversity loss rank as the top three most severe risks which have had a great physical and economic impact. While human environmental damage and natural resource crisis also pose a major risk due to human activities. To avoid the greater economic and biodiversity loss caused by climate change, the government of Indonesia has successfully integrated the low carbon and climate resilience development policies into the National Medium Term Development Plan RPJMN 2020-2024 as mandated by Article 3.4 of the UNFCCC confirming it as the first green RPJMN in Indonesia's history. The recent COVID-19 pandemic has caused a severe impact on both people and the economy. Therefore, an economic transformation is needed to recover from the pandemic and to realize Indonesia's vision to be a high-income country by 2045. The transition to a green economy is one of the economic transformation strategies where low carbon and climate resilience development act as the backbone. The transition requires a precise approach to measure the progress while ensuring that the economic transformation is tangible, representative, and reliable. Bapanas has developed the Indonesia Green Economy Index, a tool to measure green economy progress with 15 selected indicators. The index consists of three pillars of sustainability, environmental, economic, and social pillar. The indicators for environmental pillar consist of forest cover, share of renewable energy, managed waste, percentage of greenhouse gas emission reduction, and percentage of degraded peatland. The indicators for economic pillar consist of emission intensity, final energy intensity, gross national income per capita, agricultural productivity, industrial sector labor productivity and service sector labor productivity and the indicators for social pillar consist of mean year of schooling life expectancy 
poverty rate, and unemployment rate. These indicators will be reliable factors to determine the success of the economic transition process. The Green Economy Index, measuring the progress of each indicator from the target based on Indonesia's Vision 2045 and Low Carbon Development Indonesia model to achieve net zero emissions in 2060. The implementation of the Green Economy Index is an important key to support an inclusive and sustainable economic transformation. In 2011 to 2020, the Green Economy Index Indonesia shows a rising trend, pointing to the right path of green economic growth for the nation and the synergy between three sustainable development pillars. The Green Economy Index will be one of the development targets in the National Medium-Term Development Plan 2025-2029 and the National Long-Term Development Plan 2025-2045. By working together, we can achieve a higher green economy index as we accomplish Indonesia's vision in 2045, which will catalyze strategic low-carbon policy exercise and accelerate Indonesia's economic growth in the future. And now we would like to invite onto center stage His Excellency, Chief of Planner of the Ministry of National Development Planning of the Republic of Indonesia, Director for Environment, Ministry of National Development Planning of the Republic of Indonesia, Development Director, UKFCDO, and GIZ Cluster Coordinator for BMUV. Please, can you bring the Green Economy Index report to step up to the stage for our photo session? Thank you. The count of three, three, two, one. Thank you, and we are now inviting to the stage to join in LCDI Commissioner, member of the Green Caucus of the Indonesian Parliament House. Senior Researcher, National Research and Innovation Ag Agency, BRIN, and Moderator from Lingkar Temu Kabupaten Lestari. Please, may we invite you to join on stage for this photo session. We have uh, to unmask for this session. So, with three, two, one, everybody say Bali. Ready? Three, two, one, Bali. One more time. Three, two, one. Thank you very much. Let's give our applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, VIPs. We invite you to return to your seat. We invite to remain on stage Excellency Chief of Planner of the Ministry of National Development Planning Mohon berkenan untuk tetap di atas panggung Pak This is the session entitled Setting the Context and it is an honor for us to request 
Chief of Planner of the Ministry of National Development Planning of the Republic of Indonesia, His Excellency Arifin Rudianto. His Excellency Mr. Suharso Muno Arfa, Minister of National Development Planning, Head of National Development Planning Agency, Bapenas. His Excellency Mr. Owen Jenkins, British Ambassador to Indonesia and Timor Leste. Her Excellency Ms. Ina Lepel, German Ambassador to Indonesia, ASEAN and Timor Leste. Honorable Speakers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan, and good afternoon to all of you. First of all, uh, best regards from the Bito Minister for Maritime Affairs and Natural Resources, Bapak Rizal Primana. Actually, she, he should be here to give introduction speech. But uh, Sunday evening, just five minutes before we boarding to Denpasar, he uh, informed phone call from his brother, informed him that his mother just passed away and he back home and asked me to give introduction speech on behalf of the Deputy Minister for Maritime Affairs and Natural Resources. Welcome to the third G20 Development Working Group set event. Hopefully, you are all in good health and have been enjoying your visit to Bali, Indonesia. We have witnessed earlier the launching of the Indonesia's Green Economy Index and quoting Minister Suarez's remark, the release of the index marks another milestone for Indonesia in moving toward a green economy. Hence, I would like to use this opportunity to elaborate on how this achievement represents a new chapter in accelerating green economy development in Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, aside from the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and geopolitical instability, the world is faced with other crises that expose humanity to serious danger. There are the three interrelated crises called the triple planetary crisis of climate change, pollution, and biodiversity losses. The climate crisis is causing record-breaking temperature all over the world and more frequent extreme disaster events. According to a report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, by 200 and 2100, this climatic condition may endanger the life of approximately 50 until 75 percent of the global population. Meanwhile, there is also the issue of increased pollution where air pollution become the most significant cause of disease and premature death in the world, causing up to 4.2 million death annually. On top of this, the loss of biodiversity could adversely threaten human well-being and ecological system, impacting human health and food security. The Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services IPBES, estimated that about 1 million plant and animal species currently face the threat of extinction. Ladies and gentlemen, the fate of every living species on Earth will depend on how we choose to respond to this triple planetary crisis. In the meantime, this crisis can pose uh, can pose a major threat to the fulfillment of our development target, including the sustainable development goals. The following scheme shows 
how human induced pollution such as from land and sea use change over exploitation fossil fuel combustion has resulted in widespread loss of biodiversity and climate change both crises are ultimately driven by multiple indirect drivers that are underpinned by social values when those societal values adopt a business as usual mindset the human pressure will result in negative trade-off to the natural carrying capacity including our climate ecosystem services and biodiversity if this pattern continues the system will eventually collapse making it impossible to maintain a good quality of human life a transformative change in there is therefore critical to shift towards an interaction system that maintain the balance between socio-economic activities and environmental carrying capacity hence green economy is established as the new economic development paradigm that involve sustainable production and consumption to promote sustainable development. To that end, we introduce the green economy strategy within the framework of economic transformation. This economic transformation is intended to bring Indonesia out of the middle income trap and achieve Indonesia's vision of becoming a high income country by 2045. Our green economy strategy refers to a transition toward an economic development model to support sustainable development, focusing on greener investment and capital accumulation, greener infrastructure, and green job to achieve social welfare and environmental sustainability outcome. In applying the green economy, Indonesia has a set of integrated platform called Low Carbon Development, LCDA, and Climate Resilience, CRD, policies that function as the backbone of the green economy. Ladies and gentlemen, our simulation result indicate that implementing a green economy will offer multiple benefits and lead Indonesia to reach net zero emission by 2060 or sooner. As highlighted in our projection, applying green economy can reduce our greenhouse gas emission intensity by nearly 68% by 2045. Here, emission intensity refers to the amount of greenhouse gas emission per unit of gross domestic product GDP which is an important indicator since we obviously want to the country's economy and productivity to be growing as greenhouse gas emissions are reduced. Other benefits also include green employment, new technology enhanced, and many more as featured on our last green economy report. To measure the effectiveness of the economic transformation toward achieving a green economy, we establish the Green Economy Index with tangible, representative, and accurate indicator of success. The Green Economy Index consists of 15 indicators that are classified into economic, social, and environmental pillars, as seen on the slide. According to our Green Economy Index finding, a 10-year period Indonesia's Green Economy Index Composite score has increased from 47.20 in 2011 to 59.17 in 2020. This accomplishment suggests that we are on the track to achieve our goal of developing a green economy. More about the Green Economy Index can be found on our Green Economy Index report, which will be shared after the event and is also available in digital form. Ladies and gentlemen, the interlinkage challenge posed by climate change and biodiversity loss 
need to be responded with a transformational change of the green economy. The release of the green economy index is therefore imperative to complement the efforts by providing an accurate and reliable methodology to measure its progress. Continuous enhancement of the index will certainly be carried out by taking development updates into consideration. Moving forward, the Green Economy Index will be incorporated into the next medium-term and long-term national development planning document as one of the macro development indicators. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, to realize the sustainable future that we want, we must seize the opportunity that it creates, strengthening collaboration and fostering support for the green economy is therefore a must. In this opportunity, we would like to appreciate our development partners, particularly the UK and the German government for their continuous partnership. We look forward to establishing more collaboration with other G20 members countries in accelerating the global green economy development. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Your Excellency Arifin Rudianto. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the G20 side event, third development working group meeting towards implementation and beyond, measuring the progress of low carbon and green economy, launching ceremony of green economy index, and upcoming next, the talk show, Nexus between development, climate change, and biodiversity. Allow us please to remind you for the Q&A session, feel free to raise your hands for comments or questions to the panelists. The committee will come to you to hand in the wireless microphone. English Indonesian interpreting system is available. So please acquire headsets from the registration desk right at the entrance. For our virtual audience, for Q&A session, you can send your question in the chat box with the following format. Your name, followed by your institution, followed by your question addressed to whom, and followed by the question itself. As an appropriate finale to our day, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Gilda, and allow me to introduce Madam Moderator for the talk show. With more than a decade of experience working on sustainability as part of government, private sector, and civil society, while also organizing community movements of her own, she has unique skills and diverse perspective to effectively work as a professional convener for collective action. She is now the executive director to the Secretariat of Sustainable District Association or Lingkar Temu Kabupaten Lestari, an innovative district association working towards sustainable land use through collective actions. Prior to this, She's a Union for Private Sector Coalition on Sustainable Palm Oil under the Indonesia Palm Oil Pledge and a leading member of the Planning and Funding Deputy of the former National REDD Plus Agency. On her own, she convened community movements, including Hutan Itu Indonesia, a positive campaign and movement to position for us as Indonesia's identity, Sidalang and Indonesia Plastic Bag Diet, a waste management movement and social corporate lawyer society, effort to provide low-cost corporate legal service for SMEs, social enterprises and social movement. 
Without further ado, please give a very warm welcome to Madam Moderator, Honorable Gita Shahrani. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Gilda. Hi, everyone. So this is the time when we feel what was just being launched, the history in the making, the Green Economy Index belongs to everyone. So before I invite all of the panelists to join us, the distinguished speakers to join us in the panel, I'd like to actually ask all of you to participate in um, a quick polling exercise. So if we can bring the poll um, up, so you can actually use your phone and scan the barcode here um, on the screen, or if you wanna go directly to your browser, you can go to slido.com and the event code is LCDI. This is just to give a quick summary of um, who is in the room. Um, so that the panelists uh, later on can better relate. And as what is often uh, being our worry is that a talk remains a talk, but by introducing who are in the room, we can have a more clear call to action later on. So um, thank you, that was quick. Um, 26 have also participated, people that's joining in in the WebEx. Wow, that's quick. 37, 44 now, will reach 50. Yes, more than 50. 15 seconds to go. I think we can reach maybe 70. <laughs> so out of the 56 that's right now already polling, we know 45% is coming from the government side. 19% are coming from development partners, now 18%. Wow, past the mark of 71. Congratulations. Can I give a big round of applause for everyone? And I invite all of you to join. So 89 right now, already in our poll, 47% are, I think we're reaching 100 um, about now, but development partners are 20%, general public are now 12%. Academician and students are now 9%, private sector, 8%. Can we go scroll a bit down? We have also civil society on, in the room, I think. Yeah, just scroll down, thank you. Um, so this basically looks uh, very multi-stakeholders, as what uh, Pa Rudy just mentioned in his speech, that green economy is not something that we can do in silo. This is something that we need to do collectively through collective actions. Now, we have passed 100 now, 102. Only one more question before we bring out the distinguished speakers onto the panel. Can we go to the second question? Now we can go a bit more creative and I will change this side so that I give equal attention to ensure fair and just transition as well. So the word that I'm looking for is what is the one thing? Give us one word. Oh, sorry. Um, the question before this, can we go to one question back? Okay, one word that describe your feelings after witnessing the launch of the Green Economy Index. So what describe your feeling? Give us one word that describe your feeling. After the dance, you look at the report, you, uh, you heard Bapak Rudy already also um, explaining why it's urgent. You're about to hear the amazing talk show. Excited, we have um, great, hopeful, exciting. Happy, amazing, curious, optimistic, great. There's an emoji as well. So I think Gen Z are in the room as well. Um, there's also proud, enthusiast, OMG. There's somebody that wrote that. Keren katanya. Econometry. There's also hope, urgent, positive. Let's give another 15 seconds probably. I think we can go to 100. Thrilling. There's a thumbs up. Another emoji. Wow, lots of emoji. <laughs> so I think in terms of demography who's in the room, I think a lot of you are also part of Indonesia's 190 million bonus demography who are looking for jobs. Like Pak Rudy mentioned, 1.8 million of jobs are going to be created if green economy is implemented by 2030 alone. Green economy is real now. Let's do it. Lega. Fine. We've passed 100. Another big round of applause for everyone. And this, 
has brought me into a very positive mood, uh, very excited, like the big words that um, are appeared on the screen, to call upon all of the speakers that's going to be joining us on stage. The first, without further ado, will be Bapak Medril Zam, the Director of Environment from Bapenas. Uh, Pak Medril Zam will then elaborate on how Indonesia defines green economy, how the green economy index is urgent right now, and also what does it mean to actually track progress and navigate the development on its pathway towards green economy. Then we will have Ms. Dia Roro Esti, a member of parliament, also LCDI commissioner and secretary of Green Economy Caucus from the House of Representatives. Ms. Roro will explore effort of implementing green economy through low carbon development and actually emphasize on the role of having a just energy transition to accelerate transformation towards green economy. And then we will have Professor Eni Sudarmonowati, a senior researcher representing the National Research and Innovation Agency, or BRIN. Prof. Eni will provide perspective on bioprospecting and sustainable use of policy to support green economy development. We will also be joining, um, have Stephen Stone joining online, the Deputy Director of Economy Division, UN Page, that will discuss the importance of green economy within an international point of view and share some ways to measure progress of green economy in, in the, at the implementation level, especially in different countries. Last but not least, as I'm very excited to welcome the previous COP president, UK, also as a G7 and G20 country members, Amanda McLaughlin, Development Director of UK FCDO, and she will share about various experiences, especially the UK have, face, uh, have faced in creating and enabling factors to enable green economy and how G20, especially the summits this year, will play a critical role in driving global green economy development. So this is all sounding very exciting. And without further ado, I would love to have all of the panelists join me on the stage. So now that we have everybody on stage, I would like everybody's uh, permission if we can take off our mask. Yes? Agree? Okay, agree? It's okay? Thank you, everyone. So now that we have all the exciting speakers up on stage, I will now begin with one of the men behind all of the great work that we are going to celebrate today. Um, we saw how green um, economy index are one of the beacon of hope to actually measure progress and actually keep us on track. And I wanted to dig a little bit deeper with you. Um, after Pak Rudi mentioned all of the very exciting trajectory that Indonesia can actually obtain and also other countries can get inspired by, what is it that makes it urgent to actually Issue, issue it now, and what are the recent key findings um, that uh, maybe we can focus on as our priority going forward? So, Pak Medril, you can kick us out with uh, some exciting facts as well, Pak. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Pak uh, Gita. Well, uh, to answer these questions, um, I think I need to flash back a little bit. Uh, I think everyone uh, understand that the terms of green economy, basically, uh, we know this from for some for such sometimes. I believe uh, this this terms has been um, uh, initiated uh, probably about uh, about the two hundred uh, into twelve in two thousand and twelve uh, when we uh, conducted uh, the the. Um, Rio declarations plus 20 at that time. So uh, we know these terms uh, for quite some time, but, uh, and then we know that the, the objectives of this, basically we would like to achieve what 
that we need to have a higher economic growth while we improve our environmental carrying capacity and also we uh, in the same time we also enhance our uh, social capital and social cohesion and basically we try to support the de sustainable development aspects but then uh, we talk a lot about this but uh, in the same time we are also questions by a lot of uh, stakeholders that uh, actually what is it and how then we know that uh, we we are on the right track or we are in the uh, a good a good situations to support this green economy uh, for the future so then this is why then uh, we uh, we in Bapanas, we try to answer these questions for such uh, which re uh, trajectory that we want to aim and also what sort of uh, uh, where we are now, basically, with regards to the um, uh, this green economy progress. And uh, in Bapanas, we try to answer these questions by designing this green economy index that you've just uh, seen. Uh, explained by the ministers and also by Pak Rudy. Basically, the Green Economy Index uh, has been derived from, of course, from the international uh, experience, from the international approach. We try to uh, adopt some uh, methodologies that have been applied in the international uh, forum. And also, we extensively use our low, ec low carbon economy model that we have developed so far so uh, to establish our future for our net zero emissions and also for our planning for 2045. So then we selected 15 indicators that uh, Pak Rudy has already mentioned. And basically these indicators uh, have been selected uh, uh, with a very, very careful uh, approach. We applied the uh, smart criteria indicators the indicators must be very specific, measurable, this is very important, measurable and uh, achievable uh, and also um, attainable and reliable and timely bounded. Yeah. So, uh, well, uh, we probably about three to four months to establish this and we, in, we intensively discuss with a lot of experts and also some uh, uh, academia as well and discuss internally in Bapanas and talk with uh, a few line ministries as well. So uh, then we came up with the figures that uh, Pa Rudy and also the ministers has already presented. So if you see the figures uh, that uh, please uh, next slide please and yeah and, and if you see the figures here and we actually try to record for each indicators, uh, all the progress for each indicators. As you can see that the, in terms of economic pillars, basically it's actually the most progressive ones. Yeah. Uh, as you can see here that the score increased from 34 in 2011 to about 74 in 2020. But there are four other uh, indicators that are categorized, which has a very uh, good progress, yeah, a very good score. There are forest. These are these indicators are forest cover, uh, managed waste, and also industrial labor productivity, and also life expectancy. And if you see also on the right chart, on the right, yeah, as you see that there is a thick, a, a, a bit thick line, yeah. Uh, in the green thick line, and it's actually the same as Pak Rudy has already presented. But in this chart, I would like to show you that the progress for each composite indicators, basically for the uh, economy, social, and also the environment. And as you can see here, that I would like to underline that the the overall for each indicator, the overall progress. Uh, the, uh, you can see that there are overall progress for each, but in terms of the environmental indicators, the environmental pillar, this is much more lower than the economic and social uh, indicator. This shows us that there are still some things to do with our, econ with our environmental uh, uh, performance. And actually within the last five years, we are, uh, we are on the right track. And I think uh, there are some um, indicators that are also related to energy that really uh, provide uh, 
a good uh, support for the overall performance of the indicators. Uh, the energy indicators, which is the renewable energy and also the, the final energy intensity is actually the most uh, influenced ones. Uh, and I think uh, this also uh, you know, uh, require more and more uh, support in terms of uh, uh, achievement uh, in the future. I think I stopped here. Probably later we can uh, discuss further. Thank you, Pa uh, Madril. And I love the red box um, in the corner there that basically summarizes how it signals the need to actually have more ambitious environmental policy. But I also noticed that you mentioned there are some almost beacon of hope, a ray of light at the, in the energy sector. Yeah. And the final energy intensity being one of the highlight as well as although the score might be right now modest, but there are room to grow. Yes. Now that we have um, Ms. Roro on stage, I'd love to move a bit to you and dig deeper on the energy part. Um, I know that you've been advocating for the um, renewable energy and new energy bill and also are leading now the Green Caucus. So maybe can you explain a little bit a, a little bit about that, whether that would actually answer the yellow, uh, sorry, the red box that Pak Meril has on his slide. Yeah, so um, firstly, thank you so much for having me here today. It's uh, an honor um, and it's, you know, wonderful to see so many like-minded people in one room. I think that gives a lot of motivation for all of us to actually create the changes that we need to see um, in the future. So my role in Parliament currently uh, as a member of Commission 7, which deals with the energy and research innovation and industry sectors, um, also uh, a secretary of the Green Economy Caucus I was mentioned before, but at the same time commissioner of the LCDI. So I'm very, you know, pa quite passionate about, about this issue. And um, because we deal extensively with the energy sector, mm -hmm. We're currently working on a renewable energy, new and renewable energy bill, um, with the hopes that we can, you know, achieve the 23% target by uh, 2025. And we understand that this requires a lot of work, um, given that this is also in line with, uh, you know, our nationally determined contributions. We've ratified the Paris Agreement, and that's been translated into law number 16, year 2016. And so. There's a lot of work uh, that needs to be done. And I think all in all, when we speak of climate action, uh, particularly within the energy sector, we have to uh, remember that you know, this contributes roughly 34.2% of our total emissions as uh, projected from the data in 2019 from the Ministry of Environment. And that is um, you know, second after the land use, land use change in forestry sector. Uh, consisting of 49.5%, and that is then followed by the waste sector, 7.2%, um, as well as the agriculture sector, 5.8%, and lastly, the industry sector, 3.2%. So the energy sector contributes quite a lot when we speak of um, our emissions in Indonesia alone. Yeah. And so through this legislation, we hope that at least we can pave the way forward in, uh, in really just pushing through uh, energy transition in our country. We recognize that energy transition is one of our you know, main pillars of the G20. Mm. And so this momentum is something that needs to be optimized on. And all of this, of course, uh, one of the most important things, and I, we mentioned this earlier in the media briefing, uh, is the fact that political will is one of the most detrimental factors in any kind of change, um, whether we like that or not. So this is this is a reality, and any kind of um, you know issue that we'd like to push, any kind of change, um, it needs to go through a particular po a political process. And we recognize this because in the Indonesian parliament right now, this is consisting of around nine political parties. Yeah. And so pushing this bill on renewable energy uh, requires a lot of negotiation that happens uh, within the parliamentary building. And so the good news, uh, and this is something that I'd like to share with everybody here, is that this legislation is currently being worked on. Um, we hope to see this being enacted uh, this year, hopefully. 
um, and and hopefully this can also you know not only boost uh, foreign direct investment in this field, but this can also uh, even out the playing field for um, you know energy resources that are not as popular, uh, because we understand that Indonesia right now is currently driven by the uh, fossil fuel industry. Our economy is driven by the fossil fuel industry, and uh, there are uh, multiple issues that we are currently faced to faced with when we speak of enhancing uh, renewable energy going forward. Um, and, and that has to do with you know, the oversupply of, of electricity in several areas, including the Java Island. Yeah. And so when we want to push renewable energy, we're also dealt with this, you know, this issue of oversupply of electricity. And so how do we navigate around uh, these issues? Aside from that, uh, when we speak of renewables, this is still not as competitive within the energy market in comparison to, for example, coal or um, you know, natural gas. You know, right now, uh, when we speak of the energy mix, 38% itself is driven by coal and 31.2% you know, by petroleum and 19.3% natural gas. And right now for renewables, we're still at around 11.5%. There's a lot to be done. Yeah. There's a lot to be, to be done and the parliament can't work alone on this. We need to work uh, together. We need to join hands. And one of the great things uh, within this political process is opening our doors to um, not, you know, inputs coming from all the different sectors. So we invited around 21 uh, institutions, whether it be coming from the private public sectors, um, whether it coming from the academia, uh, from the government, uh, societies, you know, um, all playing a part in contributing in terms of the discussions which happened across uh, when we speak of the renewable energy bill. So I hope that this can at least, um, you know, make green economy possible in our country, at least within the energy field, because we know that when we speak of green economy, we're also talking about all the other factors that are currently contributing to uh, you know, our carbon emissions. And so I think with that being said, it's so important for us to kind of uh, build on each other and have this momentum going, keep this momentum going um, forward as well. Thank you so much. And also thank you for shedding some light in terms of how it works in the parliament. People think that a bill just automatically goes through and like, what are they doing in the parliament? But it takes a lot of negotiation. And also, as you mentioned, I will later on go back to you and ask whether the Green Caucus is the driving force that we need. But um, I wanted to maybe um, ask Amanda, uh, Ms. Esti describe what's happening within the parliamentary system of Indonesia and how it means to negotiate between different parties. I imagine UK experiencing um, the same, but also in the context of G7, G20, and during the COP presidency, also there might be some relevant experiences that you think um, can actually be relevant to push the countries to stick together, so to speak. Thank you, Beck Gita, and thank you so much for inviting me to join this panel. It's a real honor to be sitting next to such illustrious um, colleagues on this panel today, so thank you. Um, we wanted to be here because um, the UK is very proud um, of the work that we've done to tackle climate change over many years. And just first to say a word or two about that before moving on to the G20 question. The UK was the first country in the world to create a legally binding national commitment to cut greenhouse gas emissions, and the first economy, advanced economy to set a net zero target for 2050. Internationally, the UK sees climate change and biodiversity loss as our number one foreign policy priority, and that was set out in the integrated review that was put together a year or so ago, and then more recently in our international development strategy that was launched two months ago that put climate change and biodiversity right at the heart of our international agenda. Through our partnerships across the world, including with many G20 economies, we work to strengthen recognition and implementation of the climate, biodiversity and development nexus that we're discussing today. In Indonesia, for example, the UK is focused on supporting Indonesia's own objectives on climate change. Um, in April this year, the UK and Indonesia signed the Partnership Roadmap, which aims to boost our bilateral relationship 
across a range of sectors, including trade and investments, science and global health. But if you look at that roadmap, climate change and low carbon growth is right at the heart of our bilateral partnership. And we really want to come in behind Indonesia's impressive leadership on this area and support it as best we can. And in that spirit, turning to the G20, we obviously really welcome Indonesia's strong focus on climate, environment, and energy issues within their G20 presidency. And particularly, the inclusion of energy transition as one of the overarching priority themes this year. Last year, the UK COP26 presidency secured the agreement of the Glasgow Climate Pact, a significant step forwards with commitments on mitigation, adaptation, finance, and collaboration. And this pact keeps 1.5 degrees alive. But the need for implementation and action of the pact is increasingly urgent. Therefore, as the UK and COP presidents, we urge that the G20 this year must continue that momentum from COP26 and ensure that these historic commitments made are rapidly turned into action. We also think that countries can really learn from and be inspired by one another. And fora such as the G20 in this session today can play a valuable role in enabling that sharing of experiences and lessons learned. And in this sense, the launch of the Green Economy Index today is really relevant. It's an important step forward for Indonesia in implementing its green growth pathway and informing and, and inspiring others to do so too. And we're really proud to have been able to support BAPANAS in its leadership of this initiative through the Low Carbon Development Initiative. Finally, particularly glad to see the focus on the nexus, so bringing biodiversity in alongside development and climate. Um, this is a new and increasing focus for the UK. In our recent um, international development strategy, we put biodiversity and climate change at the heart of it and committed to spend at least three billion pounds on nature and nature-based solution over the next few years. I'll stop there, but thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, busy scribbling down notes in terms of actually describing the nexus is something that is also at the heart of how UK perceive to move, move forward. And the panel today actually represent that. And we'll hear from Professor Annie next about how biodiversity is actually one of the critical um, aspect of pushing this green economy concept going forward. But I wanted to say hi to Stephen that have joined us online. Uh, maybe the panelist doesn't um, realize that he's actually back there. <laughs> hi, Stephen. And also um, saying hi to participants in WebEx. I've been told that there are more, more than 100 joining us um, in WebEx uh, online. And if you have any questions, those who are joining us um, online, feel free to actually make use of the Q&A box. And those of you that's attending here, scribble your question and you can uh, raise your hand when the discussion um, time comes. But now, let's hear from uh, Professor Annie. What is it about biodiversity that needs to get us excited, but also cautious? Because biodiversity loss and biodiversity collapse is something that are less heard of, but are very critical. Uh, thank you, Mbak Gita. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you uh, for having me uh, today to share with you. Well, um, I'm not going to repeat again and again about um, how rich is Indonesia is in terms of biodiversity. Mm. Because we know already that combining terrestrial and marine, we are number one. Yeah, if it's yeah. just a terrestrial, yeah. maybe Brazil number yeah. one. So uh, are we proud of that? No. We have to do more things. Like uh, 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 Roro already mentioned that um, a lot things to be done. A lot of things to be done. So, uh, can we? Can I show the the slides at the background? Because yeah, I, yeah, there you okay. go. Yeah. So, uh, by the time that we have more budget and also more uh, time to do research and to explore our nature, you can see from the table on the, uh, your right uh, hand side that. Uh, the number is increased. So the, the ratio of, the, of certain taxa of, uh, uh, in Indonesia as compared to the world always increased. 
So if you talk about Java, maybe there are a lot of green uh, uh, dotted. Uh, that means that uh, a lot of species are found in Java. But it doesn't mean that Java is uh, uh, richer than other uh, islands of Indonesia. That because it's closer, so we don't need more budget to explore the biodiversity. So that's why uh, by 2014, uh, as compared to 2017 or 2018, you will see that uh, the, the ratio is increased. And also the one for marine, because it hasn't been explored for uh, many years. And now, just 2017 and 2018, we found several species, species that are new. But we haven't really explored the importance or the, the, the use of these uh, new species. So that's why explorations, uh, characterizations, identification and characterization, and then also screening to uh, find uh, a useful uh, uh, method or, and also using the useful technology uh, to find uh, the new compound. Uh, can I uh, have the previous, the first one first, uh, the first one slide first? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so here you can see, uh, maybe it's too small for you to see, but uh, by exploring this, uh, a quarter of plants in the world actually produce pharmaceutical. I mean, the pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical uh, compounds uh, actually produce from a, a, qu a quarterly from the plant. And there are a lot, for example, from marine, uh, not actually utilized by Indonesia, but found by someone from foreigners, for example, and also from uh, international uh, pharmaceutical companies. For example, the one from marine, the, uh, a kind of uh, 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 snail, Mm. And uh, this one actually the venom of snail and it's worth a um, million of uh, US uh, dollars. And also uh, back uh, 70 years uh, back old that uh, uh, the, the American found an antibiotic uh, isolated from the soil in Kalimantan, which is mm. now worldwide used as uh, vancomycin, yeah, mm. still in use. Yeah, so this takes a lot of time. So I'm going to show you the, the phase. There are at least uh, five steps to, uh, to have from the uh, biodiversity and then to explore it, to characterize it, and then to screen, and then also to uh, put it in the market, mm. and then to make people, uh, I'm talking, I'm going to make a focus on the local community. So how to share with uh, the benefit to uh, local people. So this takes a lot of time. And then uh, uh, you can see the figure here is uh, an average to have um, at least uh, nine years to have this uh, product uh, available in the market. So it can be like a billion US dollar and more than eight years to produce this one. So I just give you illustration. Um, the uh, profiling uh, technology to have the metabolite secondary, uh, secondary metabolite. And uh, I would like to give you that we have a lot of uh, uh, findings that may be already uh, uh, TRL. TRL means uh, technology readiness level, four to six, that we can just harvest and then uh, produce, combine uh, uh, with the uh, budget from private sectors, I would like to underline the <laughs> contribution from yeah. the private sector. So here you will see next slide. Yeah. Next slide, please. So this just the examples that we already there. This is just nine uh, uh, I listed, but there are many more. So for example, the PGPR, you can replace the uh, fertilizer as the biofertilizer and also for the biopesticide. Yeah, so this one uh, found in only talking about the conservation areas, 
but there are other areas that we need uh, to uh, uh, to explore. So this one, like anti-cancer, and also uh, other uh, compounds found in uh, Gunung Ciremai National Parks, uh, uh, Rinjani National Parks, and others. Yeah. So uh, this, I think, uh, when we uh, trying to harvest this one and then uh, collaborate with pharmaceutical companies in Indonesia, then we can prove that uh, we yield something and then we can share to local people. We just make a model how to uh, give the benefit to, uh, benefit sharing to the local people. So that's why I really support the index uh, for the yeah. green economy. I think we need to uh, continue Pak Medril. Uh, to do simulations, how to uh, do the benefit sharing for local community from this, uh, only from these uh, examples. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this is nine concrete example of how, if I can tie back to what Amanda just mentioned, nature-based solution fund that's available out there can actually be allocated for sustainable business that supports local community, but also embrace and finally provide value. Why biodiversity matters, not only leaving it as is, but actually utilizing it to the next level, including to cure cancer. Um, so now I wanted to go to Stephen um, that is hopefully going to also enlighten us. We've heard from Indonesia. We've also heard from the UK experience um, in terms of how the trend is ongoing at the international level and the global development um, trajectory right now. Can you provide us with some insights? Um, what is the urgency to transform economy towards a more greener um, future? Um, I think you're still muted, but Steven. What, what, wonderful. There you Thank go. you so much, Peter. It's, uh, it's great to be a part of this panel today remotely. Um, sorry I can't be with you there in Bali because it looks like it's just wonderful. And I've been following since the very beginning. And, you know, when it comes to um, the urgency, I, I also want to echo the words of the director from Batenas and think about how far we have traveled over these past 10 years. When I witnessed the launch of the Green Economy Index today in Indonesia by the G20 presidency, and I think 10 years back to where we were at Rio Plus 20, um, that was hosted by Brazil, it is such an amazing road, it is such an amazing journey that has brought us here today. So I want to start off just by my congratulations to Bapenas, to the government of Indonesia, for the leadership that they have shown. 10 years ago, green economy was an idea. It was a concept. How do we grow in a way that doesn't destroy our asset base, that doesn't destroy the very life, um, life support systems that sustain us? I think today we have a concrete answer to that. We have a very quantitative assessment, a metric for looking at how the economy grows over time and builds in that resilience. Why is this important? It couldn't be more clear, especially from my point of view at UN Environment. Um, earlier, uh, you spoke about the triple planetary crisis. This is something that we see on a daily basis at the UN Environment Program. The climate instability, the unprecedented temperatures and fires we see across the globe, the rising levels of toxicity and pollution that are affecting human health, and also the extraordinary loss of nature that has been documented. In the face of this triple planetary crisis, we are seeing incredible innovation. We are seeing ingenuity. We are seeing solutions coming forward. I just want to mention two or three. Um, if you think about the plastics negotiation, which was launched at the UN Environment Assembly earlier this year, governments around the world, led by uh, those countries who brought this issue to the table, are now negotiating a plastics treaty to control marine plastic waste and plastic pollution. This is just one example of the kind of innovation and solutions that are needed. With this increasing pressure from the COVID lockdown, from the, the hard hit to the economy, what we are seeing today is ever more need for these kind of responses that um, will bring solutions on the job front, on the development front, and on the reducing poverty front while increasing sustainability as well. And if I wanted to leave you with one thought here about the urgency, uh, Gita and colleagues, it is that with the global response 
to the lockdown, unprecedented spending. I think the German ambassador talked around 16 to 20 trillion dollars worth of resources injected into the economy. This has created a situation where we weathered the storm, we are back on a growth trajectory, but it's an unequal growth trajectory. And now we have high rates of interest, the cost of capital is increasing, uh, the inflation is increasing, and this will increase fiscal pressure as well. And with that fiscal pressure comes the need to be more resilient, more frugal, and more uh, responsible in how resources are spent. So bringing this back into the context of the green economy transition, more and more it becomes highly important to focus the resources that are available, led by the G20, in solving this issue and creating transition pathways towards the future, towards a more resilient future. With, with that, Gita, let me hand it back to you. And uh, great, again, to be part of this conversation. Back to you. Also, now that we are weathering the pandemic, it should actually change the way of us allocating resources as country as well. But I want to go back to Pak Medril because there's a lot of expectation over this green economy index. People are excited. Excited is actually the word that we saw on the screen. So everybody are excited. Um, I would imagine coming from a district association myself that implementation would be something um, we all are excited about, but we know there will be challenges at hand. What are the type of challenges that you are already predicting and how are you planning to navigate over those challenges? Okay, thank you very much, Mbak Gita. Challenges, yeah. Uh, basically, uh, in Babunas, we have tried uh, to recognize and also to explore uh, some, some uh, how then we can, you know, expedite this uh, economic, uh, green economy become realized. And basically, we identify there are at least three major challenges uh, and basically these challenges have been incorporated in our planning as well. The first challenge of course, this related to the investments. We know that uh, uh, to reach our, for example, to reach our net zero ambitions in 2060, this required huge investments in a more greener way. Uh, we have uh, estimated that our uh, green investments require about three to five percent of our GDP. So. It is a bit difficult for the government, for, for us, just to rely upon the government fiscal capacity. So we need to collaborate with private sectors, with multinational, and also with our small medium enterprise as well, to work together to invest in a more greener way, so then it could cover the rest of the government interventions. That's the first one. The second challenge, of course, when we talk about green investments, this require also some shifting of the our labor skills you know in the past our labors much more our labor skills much more focus on the uh, brown uh, activities but in in the futures and in our green economic path it's sh they uh, they should change their skill their capacity to become more greener or to become more greener uh, experts in a green uh, aspects green jobs so basically, there, there is a need to, to reskill and upskilling our laborers. And this is also the things that we have already discussed with our colleagues in Ministry of uh, Labors and also in some uh, uh, sectoral line ministries. Um, and this requires you know, a very serious attention on this. And last but not least, the third challenge, Mbak Gita, I think the, mm. the technology that has been mentioned by Ibu Eni as well, technology is very crucial. When we talk about uh, green economy, of course, uh, this will relate to a lot of changes in our economic activities, and of course, this will be influenced by technology. We just don't want to be a market from technology outside, from outside. We need to have this technology with us, 
And of course, we want to produce our products with our own technology, with more greener products with our own technology. And basically, uh, we know that uh, right now we have a very strong institutions. We call Brins, and Brin actually actually dedicated for this R and D and also for development of the technology itself. So, basically, there are a lot of uh, there are some challenges, but we are here in government. We try to tackle this uh, with some actions, not just rhetoric. Yeah. Uh, words, but this is already anticipated, and certainly, uh, of course, we cannot just do it in just one night. Uh, this yeah. is transitions that we have to, uh, 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 you know, to con th there is a transition that we have to con uh, uh, experience on this. So, but basically, we try to go uh, in the right way in this case. So the three point is actually echoing what Bueni mentioned earlier, right? Investment and the need to actually involve private sector in a more strategic manner, reskilling labor and also opening up access to technology. I want to go back to Bueni because you also mentioned Brin. Um, you mentioned a lot of exciting bioprospecting opportunities and how you said there are a lot of portfolio of technology that's ready to roll, so to speak. So um, can you maybe comment a bit, Bu, how, we, how do we push the reskilling factor so that this type of opportunity becomes the green jobs, the 1.8 green jobs that we are looking for as uh, millennials and Gen Z in particular? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Jess. Uh, from Pa Major, actually, it's very uh, intriguing <laughs> message. Yeah, so uh, first, uh, I would like to uh, share with you, I think number one is how to uh, create a sustainable financial scheme. Yeah, so uh, this one, number one, but although, although uh, on top of this is the uh, regulation or policy, because then uh, with policy, then uh, uh, you can also um, uh, regulate, for example, uh, whether we can uh, receive funding from private, private sectors directly. This is if we talk about the uh, government uh, agencies. So that's why uh, here I, I put, I propose a special financial mechanism or system that uh, independent, um, authorized by the government and has an autonomy from the government. So uh, this one, uh, uh, I look back and learn from uh, INBIO. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. in Costa Rica. Costa Rica, yeah. Yeah, so that's in uh, Spanish word. So uh, uh, international something biodiversity, yeah. So, so, so biodiversity or national biodiversity center, actually. Yeah, so uh, they have uh, been given an authority by the government to manage all uh, such things about biodiversity. So they can make a contract, then uh, they can also hire uh, researchers, and they can also ask the researchers uh, or taxonomists more, uh, and para taxonomists uh, go to the forest and then collect samples and then uh, hire experts to screen. Uh, all uh, they do it independently. So uh, this might not be possible for Indonesia, but we need adjustment. So uh, with special budget allocated for uh, uh, screening things and also for uh, 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 applying a better or modern technology. So uh, we need also to have a, a great support from the industries. So um, I'm going also to, uh, when you um, uh, create a program that will uh, come along with the budget mm. yeah and uh, uh, this needs to be a, a, a program that uh, integrated program so we've been talking about climate change yeah, yeah. and also the economic uh, development or green economy and also biodiversity they are the three actually uh, intertwine yeah so uh, they affecting uh, each other. So that's why when we create a program that needs to also uh, touching this nexus. Yeah, so can I have next slides, please? So we need to have a strategy. So this is strategy, how to uh, have our, our biodiversity uh, benefited us. Yeah, so uh, there are a lot I mentioned already about the legal aspect because this one is number one. And then uh, after that, of course, uh, implementing. If I 
can at least make a list of the yeah. policy of act or regulation that we have in Indonesia. It's more than 20s, yeah, 20-something, yeah? Uh, but we need, I think Mbak Roro mentioned about law enforcement, uh, willingness, uh, uh, political, uh, will. Poli political yeah. will, and also how to implement uh, at all levels. So um, maybe uh, only certain uh, regulation or policy that we need just to fill the gap. Yeah, but then uh, the political will and also uh, specific financial ar arrangements and uh, involvement of stakeholders, yeah. not just uh, triple, not just uh, penta, but hexahelix. Yeah, I will uh, talk about this later on. Yeah, so uh, the national resources and capacity building is needed, and also uh, the institutional arrangements, uh, the something out of the box arrangements. Yeah, and then sustainable utilization of the uh, potential areas. I mentioned about the conservation areas, but there are others, and also the involvement of indigenous people or local community, and also we need to have a model. So a model, maybe in certain areas, uh, collaboratively, uh, uh, research jointly with um, many stakeholders in one area, for example, yeah. for one uh, potential uh, uh, compound, and then uh, we do that one until commercialization. Before that, we do the preclinical trials and clinical trials, and then put in the market. So all need action. Yeah, I think I have another slide for So uh, we'll get back to the yeah. um, next part that you mentioned about yeah. the collaboration. But I wanted to go to Stephen because you mentioned your last point was yeah. if we can find one, one concrete thing that everybody can come support and it actually shows how this can be done, there, there might be um, connectivity of how that can actually be the test case to measure progress using the index, for example. So I wanted to go to Steven and ask, what do you think can be the best way to actually implement this type of um, progress measurement? Would a jurisdictional approach, such as what Prof. On, uh, Annie mentioned, work? Or would other model you think um, are more effective? I think you're still muted, Stephen. <laughs> Thank you. Gita. There you go. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I, I have to wait until I'm unmuted. Um, so I have to be patient and you have to be patient. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no worries, no worries. No, it's an excellent question. I, I want to go back to what Roro was saying about um, political will earlier, because I think we have the technical solutions and the technological solutions are there to be found. Uh, we are incredibly innovative. Uh, with pressure, we will find the solutions. It's the political will that is sometimes challenging. And so it was very interesting to hear about the, um, the energy transition law, which is being tabled, the renewable energy transition law, which is being tabled in Indonesia. If I think back to a few days ago earlier this week in the United States, which is a country where I come from, uh, the Senate passed a climate bill for over $300 billion. So these are signals that we hear the urgency, we need to coalesce. And for me, Gita, just very simply, the fact that Indonesia with the G20 presidency has put green economy onto the table of the development working group signals that we realize we need these kind of solutions and we need to work on them together. And I think the fact that um, uh, our colleagues from Bapinas are being very open about how the methodology will um, transpire, how it's been created, uh, creates this open source approach to learning and to sharing which will be absolutely vital for our common survival. So there are rays of hope, and this today is one of them. Back to you, Gita. Thank you so much. And um, I think you mentioned, you know, looking at it uh, from a sectoral perspective, for example, narrowing it down to energy would provide us with better illustration on how this can actually work in terms of measuring progress. So I wanted to poke Miss Roro again. <laughs> so probably one insight. What do you think? Uh, if we were to focus on energy, can that be the measurement that we need to showcase how the index can actually work? And also, would the Green Caucus become the driving force that enable all this measurement to actually uh, happen at the implementation level? Yeah, um, 
that, that's a really good question. I think it's really important to recognize that not only the energy sector plays a role uh, in, in development or green development generally, but there are so many other uh, sectors which, was, which I mentioned uh, earlier um, as well. And so I think it all comes down to priority um, and also, again, the willingness to create the changes that we need to see, right? Yeah. And so in terms of priority, when we speak of climate change, and again, we discussed this before in the media briefing, um, uh, you know, this is an issue, a problem that is recognized by society uh, falling under the middle and upper class. You know, why do I say this? I say this because uh, usually those who are educated, right, mm. who understand about the issue and are um, uh, aware are usually fa falling under those uh, classes. And I say this with experience um, as a parliamentarian representing two million people in my district of Grisik and Lamongan in East Java. Uh, we are very active in uh, going to you know, our constituents and, and talking to society, especially when we speak of, for example, you know, it, it's my job to also let them know that, look, this is a bill that we're currently yeah. working on in parliament. Um, you know, what, what's your perspective? And and when we speak of electrification, um, and also there's a program actually on street lamps that is powered by uh, the sun, so solar energy. And so, you know, implementing these kinds of programs um, in, in my district uh, also coincided with the conversations that we had with the public. And for them, it didn't, they, they weren't very aware with regards to where the, the, the source was coming from. All they cared about was that the light is shining, yeah. they have access to electricity, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, they have, you know, access and they can pay for it, mm. right? That it's cheap, affordable. affordable. Yeah. And these are the kinds of issues that they care about. And so, um, you know, it's, it's so important for us to socialize um, about this issue, right, on the issue of climate change and also enact the right policies, uh, particularly in parliament, and yeah. that boils down to political will. And so when we, um, you, you asked about the Green Economy Caucus, it's something that I also learned uh, through the process of understanding that it turns out that there needs to be a movement even within the system. Right. And so in, uh, within the Green Economy Caucus, uh, which is led by Ibu Mercy Barons from the PDIP part uh, party, uh, you know, this is a, a caucus consisting of more than 20 members of parliament coming from all political parties in parliament and also representatives from all uh, 11 committees in the Indonesian parliament. And so the, the focal point of this is to make sure that we do uh, push a green economy uh, through legislation and policy making. So in Commission 7, we're working on the renewable energy bill. Yeah. In Commission 11, for example, dealing with the, more of the financing aspect uh, with regards to uh, also taxing systems, you know, with carbon tax, uh, carbon pricing systems, uh, and ensuring that anything that is green is more, um, you know, uh, desirable. So how can we make it more desirable in the process? And also Commission 4, which deals with the forestry sector as yeah. well, has a legislation and so having, uh, you know, multiple legislations uh, playing a role is, is very, very important. And I think the last point I'd like to also mention is that, again, do we want to see this as an opportunity or a barrier, mm. right? The reason why we are so hesitant to want to make change is because, you know, we don't see it as an opportunity. We don't see it as a problem of today. And so how can we socialize it to the public that this is actually something that we are currently facing now, especially, you know, we see the heat wave affecting Europe right now, you know, and, and this is a, a, a climate crisis, a climate emergency. So are we willing as policymakers, as decision makers in the room, willing to create that change that we need to see? And that again boils down to collaboration because there's a lot of opportunity um, in this space and it's a about whether we want to focus on that or not. So I think one of the keywords that you mentioned um, of, uh, from the insights are prioritization, right? Like how can we make people prioritize this? And I wanted to go to Amanda on prioritization, just building onto what Roro was saying. And because there's also a big global economic pressure right now facing all of the G20 countries, how can we make this a priority? 
Thank you. Let me say a little bit about um, the UK's thinking in the energy sector, um, which might have some similarities for other G20 countries. We've obviously seen unprecedented volatility in international energy markets in recent months and huge pressure on prices. And obviously this comes with increased concerns about energy security, including in the very short term, but also in the longer term too. Some have said that as a result of these pressures, we should focus on energy security and put tackling climate change to one side or deal with that later on. But this doesn't make sense to us. We think that the best way to increase our energy security and increase energy affordability is to make the most of cheap, reliable sources, domestic sources of power. Even before Russia's invasion of Ukraine caused a surging gas pressure, it was already clear that the case for renewable energy was as much an economic and a financial case as an environmental one. So in the UK, the current pressures have just mm. underscored the need for us to double down on our energy transition by reducing our reliance on gas, especially imported gas, and make more use of energy sources that we have ready, readily available at home, which are mainly renewable. The current global economic pressures also underscore the importance of collaboration, yeah. as you were saying. The UK recognizes the need to provide international assistance as part of a community of international development partners to support emerging and lower income economies to make their own transitions. And in the energy space, as part of the G7, the UK is championing the Just Energy Transition Partnerships with a number of countries, including Indonesia, to support their accelerated transition away from fossil fuels with a package of international support. But the same case applies to sectors beyond energy. Incomes in lower income house households are squeezed and more fragile as a result of shocks, including inflation. But climate change and biodiversity loss represent more profound threats to household incomes, jobs, and well being in the long term. And if we turn away from shoring up the resilience of people and livelihoods, including the creation of new green jobs, society will be significantly worse off, especially the poorest. Now, with that, um, we will start uh, opening up the floor for Q&A, um, also from online. I will let one question um, sit with all of the panelists, which is, we've heard about the opportunities, we've heard about the challenges, we also heard about the need to prioritize. Um, then, if you were to recommend um, ways forward, what, what would it be from your side? So I'll let that question sit with you. You don't have to answer yet. But I'm going to um, open up the floor for question. Um, in the beginning, though, I know Pa Gertz has also been um, there from the start, supporting um, the effort as well as the representative from the German uh, government. And I wanted to maybe get a response from Pa Gertz of uh, after listening after following all of the work, after seeing the launch today, and also listening to all of the panel, what is your insight in terms of prioritizing? How can Indonesia prioritize the right step forward? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gugita. Yeah, uh, first of all, let me say uh, thank you to the Papanas for all this leadership and congratulations in pushing this instrument through through all these uh, 10 years since uh, Rio plus 20. Uh, I think the Green Economic Index has the beauty of a two-sided instrument. It's an instrument for uh, communication, communication to policymakers and the general public on the importance of green economy. Uh, I think uh, that's a signal and we can use this and Indonesia can use this, uh, mm. including other G20 countries and uh, other countries of the developing world uh, as a policy yeah, signal, we can say. And on the other hand, it's a planning instrument. It goes into technical details and planning, uh, also adjusting to budgeting. And if it comes to budgeting negotiation, I think the, as uh, Ibororo explained, uh, the parliament and the committees there, they have a particular delicate role in uh, uh, leveling this out, uh, the, the, uh, the demands on the social side, uh, economic side, economic development side, and environment. And if you look at prioritization, I think the Green Economic Index, as it is uh, 
sketched now, uh, I think also gives a hint on what are the priorities. If we, uh, we saw from the presentation of, of the uh, instrument uh, that, for instance, renewable energy is very low at the moment in Indonesia. So it's clear that you can uh, use this instrument also in, in uh, pushing towards uh, more better regulation for in, in favor of uh, renewable energy deployment and also uh, enforcing uh, uh, coal power plant uh, reduction and uh, phasing out of those uh, coal, uh, coal energy use. Uh, I think the Green Economic Index uh, shows that you should not focus only on one, but you can, uh, within a range of instruments, uh, or a range of targets, uh, you can choose the most urgent ones without ne neglecting the others. Uh, as explained by Ivo Roro, uh, uh, local action is very important. And uh, that means also uh, the Green Economic Index probably also has to be broken down into provincial and even district or even f further yeah. local levels. And uh, so that uh, a healthy competition can be uh, encourage between provinces. I think the system in Indonesia encourages competition between governors and uh, also between uh, other stakeholders. Uh, you can also use this green economic index for private sector, uh, uh, big companies uh, where uh, they, they are competing for the more greener image that they display to the public. I think these, are, uh, these may be some priorities for further action. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's a concrete way, and I love how you frame a healthy competition never hurt anyone, right? Uh, instead, it leaps frog forward. Um, now, um, we can go to the online question, if there's any question from the WebEx. Otherwise, I will open up to the floor. Anybody that wants to ask any question, raise your hand. It's okay. It's a rare opportunity to be back here um, offline. We can see three-dimensional people again, <laughs> instead of only on Zoom um, screen. So yeah, any question from the floor uh, or from online all, all the way back there? No? Yes? Question from back there? OK, yeah. Can we uh, give the microphone, please, on the back? Um, yes. Um, yeah. Um, Can Austin? you maybe um, mention your name, your organization, and also um, which panelist the question is addressed for? Um, yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Lovely moderator um, and all the panelists. My name is Cindy Junika Simangunsong, and I'm from Econusa Foundation. Um, so actually, this is not um, related to specific person, but mostly um, actually for Pak Medril. Um, <laughs> the first one. Um, actually, not when, specific, but Pak Medril. Okay. Well, not specific, well, but but because the host is uh, Pak Medril. Um, when um, I was picking up key words, actually, from all the panelists, when we're talking about green economy, social, economic, environment, and then um, forest, mangrove, uh, and a lot of key words, then one thing came in mind. Then we're talking about the eastern part of Indonesia when we're talking yeah. about Tanah Papua. So when we're looking at representative inclusivity and how to save by 2060 on the NZE target, yeah. that uh, 3.2 million of primary forests are um, protected, mangrove are protected, new forests are created, then we're talking about Papua, which has the most forests remaining in Indonesia. There are more than 40% of forests um, currently remaining in, in Indonesia, uh, in Papua, I mean. So the first question is... This Only is one question, yeah. Let's see, Whoa. sorry. <laughs> Can I put it like 1A, 1B? No, no, no. One, one, one question, okay. please. Thank you. Um, <laughs> when we're talking about the priority, um, we already know that Bapanas also currently drafting the master plan for the acceleration of the development of Tana Papua, right? And it's uh, basically mainstreaming the LCDI principles as well as um, uh, whether the Green Economy Index will be mainstreamed as well. But when we're talking about the pilot provinces, okay. then I could, I could suggest that yeah. we, we, we piloting um, West Papua, for example, as the pilot point because it will okay. be a, a hulu healer. What's the English for hulu healer? <laughs> <laughs> All the way upstream to downstream. Yeah, upstream to downstream. Uh, when there are a lot of 
um, economic valuation, uh, there already been the estimation of um, natural resources economic valuation. Okay. Uh, already, um, um, the people already, um, and the um, local policy, regional sub regional policies are already there that we could just um, accelerate the process through the RPJMD and through the RIPPP that is going to launch uh, hopefully by this year. So, but all of the sorry, target, yeah. it could simply be achieved when we're focusing um, on West Papua. All the 15 indicators okay. could be simply fulfilled. So instead of a question, this is a proposition. So um, this is building from what the panel was saying. If we pick one location, focus on one sector, measure it in a way that the 15 indicators can all be measured, then can it be West Papua? Um, we'll take one more question and then let you answer. Yeah, Pamedril, so you have time to also think about it. <laughs> Thank you for the question. So uh, one from uh, Nina Yulianti um, from University of Palanca and it's addressed to Amanda. Um, thank you for assisting Indonesia's green economy. How do you forecast or evaluate the speed of the green economy after receiving foreign backing, given that the UK will, will release financing support? How long will it take to achieve the goals? So I think probably we can reframe the question in terms of how is it that you think um, UK can continue to actually assist Indonesia in its journey and at the same time also balance the prioritization that UK has on climate resiliency as well as preventing biodiversity loss? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, I would say that it's really not for me to set, set timelines and milestones and dates. Um, I think that's already a process that's begun under the yeah. leadership of the government of Indonesia and Bapanas. And I think that's why we're here today is to celebrate that, that pathway that we're already, we're already taking the first steps on and have been since 2018. Um, you know, we do expect the green economy to grow. That's what all the indicators are telling us if we take the right policy actions. Um, I think that's, Looking at the UK experience, um, when in 1990, uh, we were a very fossil fuel based economy, um, between 1990 and 2019, our economy grew by 78%, but our emissions reduced by 44%. I think once you set that policy framework and you have that political will, um, send the signals to the markets, show that you're really serious about your transition, yeah. things start to happen very, very quickly. And I really do think that this path that we're already on will start to grow exponentially. But I think that those policy signals and that political will, as others have said, are the most important things of all. Thank you. And it gives um, what, you, what you were saying reminds me of the need to actually also be resilient in the journey. Yeah? So not only show, showcase policy signal one time, but continue pushing that signal so that that also encourage others to come and support. So... Um, thank you for that, Amanda. And Pamedril, let's get back to the question. How about picking a location <laughs> so that we can focus on something and measure something concrete? Okay, thank you very much. This is a preposition, right? <laughs> uh, representing the West Papua, right? <laughs> okay, uh, well, uh, basically, uh, uh, low carbon development initiatives have been uh, very closely with West Papua province, yeah, we have an MOU, Bapanas with the West Papua government has an MOU before, and uh, we work very closely right now to develop our low carbon development strategy, and we really expect that this low carbon development strategy can be can become kind of uh, uh, a meet or a major um, milestone for, for the new RPGM day later for the uh, um, uh, West Papua province. Uh, basically, for the Green Economy Index and, and how then we can implement this. Of course, uh, we open for the whole uh, provinces uh, uh, throughout Indonesia. And uh, certainly, we really would like to see the willingness as well from all provinces to work together with us. So then uh, we can, well, you know, we can collaborate uh, very closely. Uh, so to push this agenda, not only just at the national level, but also at the each regions at each province in Indonesia. If uh, we're, we're really, we're really glad 
to see that the progress of our low carbon development initiative in West Papua, and this is uh, a tremendous progress, I believe. And of course, uh, let's see uh, the willingness to work together very closely uh, for the next stage of the uh, our uh, second our next steps of uh, LCDI. And of course, this will provide an aim towards the, to achieve our green economy objectives. Thank, Thank you, Pam Edril. Um, echoing um, what you just mentioned, the need to actually translate it down, actually also what was mentioned by Gert um, on the next step. So um, be ready, panel. After this, I'm going to t ask you the, the ways forward that you want to prioritize. But last question for Pak Medril again. Um, what is the, from Alosius Abimanyu from Clean Action Network, what is the biggest threat to actualize um, green economy? And what do you think is what it takes to increase awareness? of Indonesian people to come and support and join in in the implementation level of this plan? Yeah, well, uh, this is a very important question. I think Baroro has already mentioned that sometimes when we talk about the green economy, they think about very long futures. Yeah. And But basically, uh, what, what we would like to emphasize here is that we just cannot think that a green economy is just for the future, but it's also for now. Because we have already experienced the yeah. threats of climate change and even our biodiversity. Yeah. Biodiversity loss is huge now for Indonesia. But so that's why then it's, we have to act now. And sometimes uh, people think about this is just about the future, but no. Uh, this is uh, for us, I think, as Mbak Rodo mentioned as well, the socialization about this issue is very crucial. And to, uh, to improve our understanding about the nexus between the development, climate change, and also the biodiversity, as mentioned by Bu How Eni. all related. They are all related. And yeah. this is very crucial to be understood by not only by a few people, but also all, for all decision makers yeah. and even for the community itself. So, this is, and thank you, Ba Roro. Uh, we have a very strong political support right now yeah. uh, for this uh, green, towards our green economy. And this is also very good steps for us. Uh, so then, uh, hopefully, and also thanks to media as well, I, I would like to underline the role of media is very ah, crucial yes. as well here. And not but not least, the research institutions, we, we well, again, uh, for the, the last message for later for the collaboration, this is very crucial. But again, uh, what we would like to underline here for the uh, for the future, to imp uh, not just for the future here, but also for, for now, to be understood very well and also to be to act immediately as ipcc mentions the window of opportunity is very closing closing right yeah, it's so. imminent threat so imminent threat. um yeah. yeah thank you pa and also thank you for highlighting um colleagues from the media here that's all are also building awareness not only in this room but also outside that's very important like um roro mentioned so now back to the homework that I gave you. <laughs> what is the thing that you want to prioritize going forward? Um, as we know that it's challenging, um, Baroro, you want to kick us out with uh, what is it that you want to prioritize as a way forward? Yeah, uh, so speaking of prioritization, I think um, recognizing that everybody here in the room has a role to play, uh, prioritizing on your role in creating the changes that you'd like to see going forward. Everyone has a level of influence, um, has a level of power um, under any kind of capacity because I strongly believe and I've always believed that, you know, collective effort, you know, is, is very, very crucial in creating the sustainable future that we'd like to see going forward. And uh, how can we place sustainability at the center of every human activity. You know, this is something that I've always advocated for even before being a parliamentarian. And right now, under my capacity as a politician, how can we mobilize and, uh, you know, how can we sustain this kind of momentum in creating the right policies and join hands with either the government um, and, and everyone at the executive role as well and, and sharing that light uh, in creating that, those changes. And again, change happens not only on, on a large scale, yeah. but also a very uh, individualized scale as well. So how can you create changes to your daily life as well uh, in creating this, this future that we all want uh, and need going forward? And it's actually um, very profound in terms of this is 
probably our role in this room, the ones that are already enlightened, to try to find examples of how to make yeah. it relevant to people that are not yet related, relating themselves to this type of issue. Um, Bu Eni, you want to go next on your uh, prioritized ways forward? Uh, yes, can I have my slide just to illustrate uh, all of you here? Uh, the last uh, two. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yes, I, I think um, prioritizing in the establishment of a mechanism that uh, everybody can play a role uh, and integrated one, multi-sectoral and holistic approach. Uh, applying modern technology. So I, I already mentioned earlier about the hexa uh, helix. So this one hexa helix, so not just triple or penta. So including the NGOs and also the affected communities and mass media. So we've been uh, talking about mass media quite a lot. So the role of mass media is very important. And NGOs uh, quite sometimes a uh, uh, lot that they uh, provide a budget also and programs to support uh, the government on uh, conservation and also util uh, sustainable utilization of biodiversity. Next slide, please. So the the the, the technology that we uh, uh, should uh, uh, apply. It's quite a list of uh, uh, role of research and researchers and also technology and also supporting uh, uh, staff here, STI staff. So here, uh, for example, for the synthetic biology and others, a lot of things to do mm. for us uh, to work together. So I put there two books that uh, we need to update the status of uh, uh, Indonesian biodiversity. Uh, the first one, uh, it was done in 2014, and then the second one, it's just for flora in 2017. So we need to update the status of biodiversity of Indonesia so that we know uh, what to do, uh, what to conserve, and what to utilize. So uh, this uh, technology, including the omics technology, maybe you've uh, heard about omic technology, so metabolomic, yeah. transcriptomic, and proteomic, and other mix, uh, and also the uh, next generation sequencing, and also uh, genome editing and other yeah. green, uh, uh, modern technology, but uh, green technology. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Annie. And speaking of genome sequencing, um, it might sound very, you know, out there, but then we're also using skincare that's utilizing genome, right? Genome sequencing. Um, so people in Indonesia, sustainable businesses in Indonesia are already doing this and we need to do more. Um, let me go to Steven now that's on screen. What is your prioritized ways forward? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Gita. I'm going to be sort of a techie and go back to the quantitative side because Aurora captured so well the individual responsibility side. Um, if I were to think of three prioritization pathways for going forward, the first one would be footprints. We have the science to determine the, the climate, the nature, the pollution footprints of all the products and all the activities and all the sectors of the economy in the world, actually. The science is there. Um, and I just leave one thing for the, <clears throat> for the chat box or for those who have access to a browser. Yeah. The Sustainable Consumption and Production uh, Hotspots Analysis Tool, HAT, SCP, HAT, um, has all of that data, 25 years, 190 countries, all the sectors of the economy. It's really powerful. The information is there. The second prioritization pathway, how do we spend our money? It's budgeting. And I think others have talked about budgeting today. Um, the Recovery Observatory, which we launched at UNEP with the University of Oxford, tracked uh, stimulus and recovery spending around the world, the $18 trillion over the past two years. Yeah. But actually, there's a lot of peacetime spending as well. We have a $90 trillion economy. Every year, around 20% of that is invested. Every year, it's invested. So that's budgeting, and there are tools for sustainable budgeting. And I would encourage anyone who wants to learn more about the returns on investing in nature, um, pollution controls, and, 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 and uh, climate stability can look at the Global Recovery Observatory. There's some really interesting information there. Um, the third and the final pathway, Gita and colleagues, yeah. is this very forum itself, the G20. Mm. What an incredible forum to raise these issues. And I know that India will be taking the G20 presidency after Indonesia. 
So there's a very interesting continuity, and perhaps our colleagues at Papinas, the Indonesian presidency, may keep this issue on the table. How do we track and measure our progress towards the green economy? Thank you, Gita. Back to you. Thank you so much. Footprint, investment, and also making sure that we change the May into a must of keeping this agenda alive at the G20. Now we go to... Um, I'll, I'll leave Pa Medril for the last. So we'll go to, to, to Amanda. Thank you. I was going to say something very similar to Mbak um, Roro, actually, about um, the fact that we all, we all have a role to play, whether it's in our professional lives or in our personal lives. I really do believe that we can, through some of the choices that we make, at the ballot box or in our consumer choices or the people that we choose to follow or amplify, we can actually make a difference. Either through calling for action, calling for more urgency, that, that word that we've heard a lot today, or alternatively in celebrating success. And I just think that the people that I'm joined with on this panel today are really inspirational. There's some amazing work happening in Indonesia, in Bapanas, in the parliament, in Brin, elsewhere. So let's give these people, continue to give these people a platform, amplify their voices and celebrate success where we see it. Thank you. Yes, clapping is encouraged. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Last but not least, um, I want to know, Pamedril, um, you can also summarize in one sentence, like, I'll do all of the homework that people give me. <laughs> but I'll let you interpret on your own words. Okay. Well, of course, as the planning ministry, uh, we have a plan forward uh, to still to keep this, you know, to, to prioritize this yeah. in our next uh, development uh, agenda. So, uh, as you know, that uh, we are in the process to develop a long-term uh, development mm -hmm. plan for 2025 to 2045 to reach our uh, 100 years of our independence yeah. in 2045. And also our next medium term development plan for 2025 to 2029. And this is our, uh, well, of course, uh, we have a commitment, of course, to, to, to yeah. prioritize this in our development agenda. Um, but then uh, certainly uh, we also would like to encourage, as Bu Annie mentions mm -hmm. about, I don't know, not right now there are hexahelix here. Hexahelix, uh, yeah. As I mentioned before, Green economy is not just one sector uh, agenda. It's a multi-sector agenda, and it requires our collaborations very closely with the, even the government horizontally and also vertically. As but Cindy also asked about how then we can collaborate and also probably with the regions at the lowest yeah. level, at the districts, and the, yes, with Pita <laughs> probably later. And certainly with the parliament, thank you very much, Bu Roro, with very strong support on this. And also from the research institutes, universities, we really uh, received very great support from this site as well. Thank you very much, Bu Eni. Uh, with BRINS, we have been very closely collaborate right now. And last but not least, media, of course, that's very crucial, and also communities, and yeah. also the role of the NGOs. I agree with Bueni. Actually, the collaborations must be very, very close to support this uh, green economy agenda. And we really, of course, need to have a very strong collaborations on this. Back Thank you. you. So hopefully, Bapanas will continue facilitate this discuss discussion uh, that involves all stakeholders. And in of that course. spirit, we'll open up for one more Slido, if we can take oh. the Slido on the screen. This is the first um, support that we are providing you, Pa, <laughs> for your homework, which is to ask everybody to put what they think should be the one thing that you want to prioritize going forward after listening to this talk. So can we put the last question in? Yes. Perfect. What is the one thing that you think you can do to support implementation of green economy in Indonesia and in your own respective countries? So people in Webex, so that I feel that I'm also connected to you, please also join in in the Slido. People in the room, please feel free to also scan your barcode. In the Webex, you can also scan the barcode directly to in your screen. We have already seven participants. If panel um, up here wants to also participate, of course you can. To be a mindful consumer 
That's awesome. The first, our first entry, nuclear and carbon pricing. Wow, exciting. Um, 11 more typing. We'll give it uh, another minute or two. Uh, keep it coming. Adopting circular economy approaches. Um, and also pray for Indonesia. We need that. We need mindfulness as well to keep our consistency. Separating waste. Capacity building. Influence behavioral change. Ensure that UN Page continues to be part of this effort. Yes, Stephen. <laughs> Use less plastic. Stay committed. Collective action and have practices, best practices from local action. Chuan Lestari. Reducing the use of plastic, regenerative lifestyle, conserve the forest, minimize silo approaches, last fossil fuel usage, support follow net sink, affirmative policy, reduce food waste, composting, my kitchen waste. So this range from all individual actions, all the way to policy advocacy, mainstreaming the green economy to the grassroots things that the parliament can do, things that the civil society can do, youth involvement and sustainable business. Awesome. Keep them coming. All this will be collated and later on, hopefully, inspire Abba Penas, Pak Medril and the team to come and involve all of the stakeholders in the next step of implementing the Green Development and Green Economy Index as well as PLAN. So with that, let's give a big round of applause for all of the speakers, all of you that have inspired us to do better and stay consistent. And with one minute remaining, I have this thing where I conclude all of the session with a little poem. So, um, it's actually a limerick of some sort. <laughs> so the word that I choose to describe my feeling is chance. And the C stands for characteristic of different experiences of people often leads green economy to not be relevant. The age comes from hexahelix partnership, however, requires that it becomes an exciting opportunity for everyone, including to see it as life choices and career path. The A stands for active and consistent policy signal as well as political will might be our silver bullet. The N stands for national implementation requires healthy competition from local government as well from other stakeholders, including the private sector. Collaborations is the C, specifically on locations and on sectors, that can actually be our model. The E, last but not least, stands for elaborating next steps for implementation should involve all stakeholders and BAPANAS should facilitate it. So with that, let's close out the session. Thank you so much for everyone. Let's give a chance for the green economy to be the future, not only for Indonesia, but to all G20 countries. My name is Gita Syahrani. Very sorry if there's any mistake in moderating this session. Until then, stay safe and stay consistent. Thank you. Um, if I can ask everybody to stand up, Pak Medril is going to lead us on a selfie, no, Wi-Fi segment. Okay, udah, stand up everyone. Right. Thank you so much. So hopefully, with the selfie stick back on trend, <laughs> we would like to actually thank everyone for also uh, enjoying the panel. And we are pleased to invite all G20 Development Working Group delegates to attend a networking dinner, a side event tonight on advancing inclusive digital transformation collaboration through a quintet of capabilities. The dinner will be held tonight, 9th of August at 6.30 in Sofitel Hotel. 
And this invitation is actually dedicated for all delegates of G20 DWG, the working group. And the shuttle, um, everyone, is available for all the delegates and it will depart from the BNDCC side event venue lobby at, no, not 6, but 5.30. Thank you so much, everyone. This event is proudly presented as a collaborative work as well from the Ministry of Planning of Indonesia in collaboration with UK government, WRI Indonesia, German government, GIZ, Triple GI, and UN Page. Again, applause is required now. Thank you so much, everyone. See you next time.